Um, this morning, we are continuing in 1 Timothy. Um, so um, if you guys want to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1, that is where we're going to be spending most of our time. And we good to go, Jeremy? Awesome. Good morning. Welcome. All right. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you, King. Uh, I thank you for bringing every person here. Um, we just ask, Father, that uh, the words that are preached and teached this morning, Lord God, that they would penetrate hearts and minds, Lord God. I just, I thank you, God, for your word. I thank you that you speak to us through your word. You teach us through your word. You guide us. Lord, we are better able to know you, to love you through your word, through prayer. And so we ask this morning that we would search our hearts, examine our hearts, and we would uh, draw closer to you, King. We thank you, Father. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. All right. I am going to read, I think, the entire chapter of 1 Timothy. We we are going to be focusing on verses 8 through 11, but um, I, I, for context, I just I think I'm going to go through the, the whole chapter. All right. Is everybody there? I'll give you a minute. All right. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope, unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith. So do. Now, the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and out of a good conscience and out of faith unfeigned, from which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling. Desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. But we know that the law is good, if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me, so that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy, because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord Jesus, and the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show, show forth all longsuffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. All right, let's stop there. In the, ver in the end of verse 11, he said, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, the law is good and the gospel is glorious. That's our title for our message today. The law is good and the gospel is glorious. Well, Jesus came to seek and save that which is lost. That's us, the lost. Before the moment that Adam rebelled against God and plunged the entire human race into sin and misery, before that moment, Jesus was waiting. 
Jesus Christ was waiting to shed his blood for you. Jesus, the lamb slain, the God of all eternity, who is, he's put his mark upon you. He had chosen you and called you before time began. You and me who were born into sin and misery, we were born into darkness and despair, we were born to experience pain and tragedy, disappointment and heartbreak. This same Jesus, the Lord of glory, he stepped down into the cold, dark waters of death and he brought us to life. You who didn't love God, you who didn't seek after God, you who did nothing to deserve to be chosen, you he called to life. Jesus was waiting for you, knowing full well every sin you would commit, every way you would reject him and mock him and turn your back on him. Jesus was waiting for the right time that he had appointed for you. Before the foundations of the world, before creation itself, if Jesus had planned a specific moment for you, Scripture tells us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ shed his blood for you and for me while we were his enemies. Jesus has come so that we may have life and have it more abundantly. This is the glorious gospel. This is the sound doctrine we are to stand on, and upon it we stand and we reject all forgeries. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life, the door, the shepherd, the light, the everlasting Son of God, and there's only one way that men may know God. There's only one name under heaven that can set all men free from sin and bondage that enslaves their souls. The glorious gospel is to repent and believe. Repent and believe, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, has come down from heaven. He conquered sin and death once for all. Hallelujah. What problem is at your doorstep? What issue are you facing? What trouble is beating you down? Jesus has died so that you may have life and have it more abundantly. The question our hearts should be asking is what must I do? What must I do to be saved? What do I need to do to follow him? It's a loud and resounding repent. Repent and turn away from your sin. Repent and turn to Jesus. Cry out to Jesus and seek his forgiveness. You and me, we come to this world filthy. We're liars, we're cheaters, murderers, adulterers, gossipers, slanderers. We're foolish and undeserving. We stink like filthy rags and we are far from holy. It, it was said of Jesus in Matthew chapter 4 that the people which sat in darkness, they saw a great light. It said, them which sat in the region of the shadow of death, light is sprung up. And from that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. We all, we all start in this dark place, and it's through that gospel call that we're brought into light. This is the charge of the gospel. It's the call of the gospel. So back to our text. Paul is writing to Timothy, Paul, an apostle, commissioned, commanded, ordained by God himself. This part is important. The, Paul rarely uses the phrase commanded by God when he addresses himself. In the very first verse, he says he's commanded of God to be an apostle. He's doing this to establish an authority pattern. The people here are not, want, there's, there's some false teachings going on, and Paul is setting a standard saying, I have been given this commission, not of my own prerogative, but by God. He then further says, he is not self-appointed, but he's appointed by God, by the authority of Jesus Christ. Paul has been commissioned, and he commissioned Timothy, his son, to, st uh, to stay at Ephesus. So he's establishing Timothy is there as his uh, ambassador, as Paul is an ambassador, an apostle of Christ. So Paul has commissioned Timothy and given Timothy his authority there in Ephesus. It's from this place that he starts 
his commission to Timothy on what he's going to teach. Now, two things I want you to think about as you go through the book of Timothy, as we're reading over this in the, the next few weeks, there's, there's two main themes that I feel like keep coming up. In that, number one, it's to expose ungodly church leadership. That's one of Paul's main goals. He wants to expose where the false teaching is, make it clear what is wrong. Number two, it's to give instruction in what is godly church leadership. So you're going to see those two things going back and forth where Paul is going to be condemning what is wrong and he's going to be instructing and encouraging what is correct or what is the proper order of things. So what is good, what is bad? And this has a specific emphasis on church leadership, church order, as far as worship is concerned and doctrine is taught. There's a specific emphasis on church structure. So I want you to keep that outline in your mind as we continue to go through Timothy. Timothy, ask yourself, what is Paul, expo- what, you know, what, what is Paul exposing here? Is, is this an ungodly teaching? And in what way is Paul setting forth a sound doctrine? So let's go back to our text. In verse 8, it says, But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. I want to point out two things on this. Teachers who are misusing the law. Something we should see Paul is bringing to light. That there are people who are misusing the law. Number two, that the law itself is not bad. When it's used the correct way. So this begs the question, what are the right and wrong ways to use the law? What are the wrong uses of the law? What are the right uses of the law? And what, um, and how does that apply to us? Well, I want to start by looking at the threefold use of the law. The threefold use of the law is simply a lens to help us see three particular uses or purposes the law has. First, the law is like a mirror. It's like a teacher. It shows us our inability in light of the law, in light of God's standard of holiness. The law is the standard of holiness, and it sets an unobtainable bar for all of us. None of us can live up to that standard that God sets. The the law is holy and reflects God's holy character, and we all fail at some point in trying to keep it. So the law is a mirror. As we try, as we look at God's word, we see where we lack. If we don't see where we lack, it's most likely we might be getting self righteous. (laughs) Um, The second use of the law is civil. The civil use is to restrain evil. This is commissioning police officers, governments to help keep crime at bay, people from committing harm to others. So the, the, other, the second use of the law is it sets the standard of justice by which we punish the unrighteous. While remembering that the law provides salvation for no one. The law doesn't save you, but it does, so to speak, put the fear of God into you. Right? If there's a punishment waiting for committing that crime, you might think twice about doing it. And so by this way, it restrains the evil. The third use of the law is that, is that the law is a guide for the righteous, for righteous living, for holy living. It instructs us in what Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. This is, we are showing love and gratitude to, to God when we learn his law, when we follow his law. So just in shorthand, we have the law is a mirror, the law is a restraint, and the law is a guide. So you can remember those in that simple format. It's a mirror, it's a restraint, and it's a guide. So let's look at what the wrong use of the law is. Let's go back to verse 9. It says, the law is not made for a righteous man. It's interesting. The law is not made for a righteous man. So we just went over three uses of the law. Now what we want to understand is what does Paul mean by law in this passage? Which use of the law is Paul referring to here when he says that the law is not made for the righteous man? So before we clarify which use of the law Paul is referring to here, I want to clarify what he's not saying. Um, What Paul is not saying 
is he's not saying that Christians are to have nothing to do with the law, right? The, he's not saying that the Ten Commandments don't apply to you and me. He's not saying that. So what does Paul mean when he says that the law is not made for a righteous man? Words are containers. <laughs> a, a dictionary is very helpful on many levels, right? It, but it can only go so far in helping bring clarity and understanding to specific definitions of a word in its context. What do I mean that words are containers? I want you to think of words as Tupperware containers. <laughs> but instead of holding leftovers, it's going to contain the meaning the speaker is intending to convey, right? And one example of this is the way that we use slang, right? If I, if I say, hey, that show is super cool, do I mean that uh, the temperature of that show is, you know, the same temperature as the leftovers in my fridge? I'm not referring to anything to do with temperature when I say that it's super cool because I'm using that word in a context outside of that strict dictionary definition. Now, of course, slang eventually gets added into a dictionary, sometimes. <laughs> but we need to keep that in mind when words are used. Um, it, now, Paul here, another way that words can convey a different meaning in context is through generalizing. We might apply something and make a general statement that applies to that specific context in which we're saying it, but it's not universal. It doesn't mean that all times and all places. It means that within which the context we used it. Um, so, um, uh, going back to our text, Paul here is generalizing when he says that the law is not made for a righteous man. He's generalizing in that he is conferring to the word law the second use of the law, to restrain evil. Paul is saying a righteous man doesn't need to be restrained. A born-again Christian has been brought from death to life and is not under the law. Not in the sense of a threat of punishment. In the same way that an unbeliever is under the law. If you're not a Christian, you are not under grace, you are under the law. What do we mean by that? A Christian has been freed from the law of sin and death and is under the precious grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Christian is saved by grace through faith, and this is not of himself. This is the free gift of God. Now, grace is unmerited favor. It's unearned. So Jesus, when he fulfilled the law perfectly, and he did, he fulfilled the law perfectly in his life, we in Christ, we fulfill the law. Through, by grace, through faith, we have now fulfilled the law in Christ. So we are not under the law because Jesus has fulfilled the law. So positionally, we take on Christ's righteousness. Now, in and of ourselves, we're not righteous, but we take on Christ's righteousness. Um, the first law, the first commandment was to obey and to live. But Adam failed to um, Adam failed to, to follow that law, to obey that law. And all of us since then have followed suit. We are born under the law. The, the punishment of sin and death is hanging over all of our heads until we come to Christ. If you have not come to Christ, that, that punishment is very real and it is a very real threat. And that's what Paul is saying when he's saying that a righteous man is not under the law. He's not, he's not subject to that same punishment, that same threat of death. He's been set free by the grace of Christ. So in Romans chapter 3, it says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for the law is the knowledge, uh, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So we're not justified by the law, we're justified by the works of Christ. Um, so one use of the law is that every man would become guilty before God. The law setting the standard for holiness is reflecting God's own character. It's condemning all men because all men fail to live up to that standard. No matter how righteous we become or how self-righteous we become, 
we're never going to meet up to that standard of holiness that's codified in the law. We might think pretty highly of ourselves. We, we might think that um, that, that doesn't apply to us. I've already learned that. I'm, I've passed that grade. I've checked that box. But we need to be careful there. We need to examine our hearts because very quickly does pride puff up. Very quickly do we become self-righteous. Romans 7 says that, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. And it is helpful to remember that. We rely on Christ. Christ does not rely on us. Man's happiness, man, man's happiness, man's desire to be happy, to be liked, to esteemed, we all want to belong. None of us seeks to... Um, when we, when we start to socialize and get around other people, we want to belong in a group. Right? We want to feel accepted by somebody, even if it's only one somebody. The whole world may reject you, but if one person loves you, that, you know, we're, every person has this basic human need to want to feel liked, to belong. Um, the danger is not the need to belong. The danger is how we go about fulfilling that need. There's a popular internet personality and successful entrepreneur, an influencer, his name is Gary V. Gary V teaches that one of the ways to find happiness is to give back to somebody. This is actually a very popular teaching that's coming from the secular world right now that you can obtain happiness by giving back without expecting anything return, by just being grateful for those that are around you. And so by giving to those around you, you can find fulfillment, you can find happiness. This, just by doing nice things for people, you can feel that, you, you, you can lift yourself up, you can get that happiness that you're after. But this is selfishness. Gary Vee doesn't know Jesus, he's not a servant of Christ, and he, what he's teaching you to do is to focus on self. Any action that is not done in a heart of worship to Jesus is an act of selfishness. I want to say that again, that any action that is not done in a heart of worship towards Jesus Christ is an act of selfishness. It's plain and simple. We need to examine our motives. Are we doing this out of a heart of worship, out of a heart to serve our God, or do we have some other motivation? This leads us to talking about self-righteousness. As far as I can see it, the passage in Timothy here is talking about self-righteous hypocrisy, at least as one of its main errors. One of the main errors being dealt with. In verse 7 it says, Desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. They desire to be teachers of the law, but they don't understand what they say or what they affirm. And prior to this, Paul stated that these people had swerved away from a sincere faith, that they're puffing themselves up and pretending to be something they are not. This was the chief error of the Pharisees of Jesus' day. Furthermore, this is our perennial temptation, self-righteousness and hypocrisy. This is a continual poison and curse, and since the fall... This is part of the human condition. We are prone to turn to systems and ceremonies and get all caught up on minute specificities of every little jot and tittle. We get so focused on the letter of the law that we miss the spirit. True worship is in spirit and in truth. The ditch of hypocrisy and self-righteousness is a very real ditch. We need to check ourselves daily, examine our motivations, and keep our hearts humble because we are prone to puff ourselves up and be a prideful people. A little further on in the letter Tim, to Timothy, Paul says, this is in chapter 4, he says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. I believe Paul is talking about the same people 
the same false teachers that are in their midst. He's, he's talking about the same thing in chapter 4. When he says um, that some shall depart from the faith, he said that some were swerving from the faith. He said that in chapter 1. They're speaking lies and hypocrisy. He said in chapter 1 that they're speaking things they don't understand. They're being, they've been seduced by doctrines of devils. This is hypocrisy, plain and simple. In the end of, in verse 5 uh, of chapter 1, um, Paul says that the end of the commandment, the purpose of, the, of teaching doctrine was charity out of a pure heart and out of a good conscience to help establish an unwavering faith. One of the things hypocrisy is not focused on is not charity out of a good heart. These people are saying things, creating doctrines for their own self-benefit. And if we're not careful, we can find ourselves in a very similar spot as those false teachers did in Ephesus. In verse 7, the scripture says, Desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor where they affirm, they're speaking lies and hypocrisy. They're full of themselves and they're full and they're speaking hypocritical lies. Do we speak hypocritical lies? Pride goes before fall and these foolish ones are so full of themselves that they don't even know whose team they are on. It's easy to get distracted with our own pride, with our own selfish motivations and forget the purpose of what we're doing or why we're saying what we're saying. But we need to examine our hearts. You remember what Jesus said to the Pharisees in John 8? He told them they weren't sons of Abraham. They were sons of the devil. Now they thought they were good Christians. They were Pharisees. They were the experts in the law. They were the people that were standing behind pulpits like this that people are looking up to, looking to for how do I understand God's word? How do I understand? How do I be a good servant of God? These people were servants of not God. They were not sons of Abraham. They were sons of the devil. And we need to be careful, Christian. We need to not get so caught up with the letter of the law that we miss the spirit of the law. The Pharisees did. They became blind guides leading the blind. They didn't know whose team they were on. Their conscience had been seared and they were seduced by doctrines of devils. Do you know what seduction is? Seduction is appealing. It looks good. If it didn't look good, we wouldn't be seduced by it. It wouldn't be attractive. But it's going to come to you as an angel of light. These things, they're not going to be blaring with a sign in highlighter colors saying, this is sin. Sometimes they may be now in today's culture. <laughs> but oftentimes the, one, the sins that we need to be careful for, they're sneaky. They creep in and they deceive us. They deceive us to be like, no, I'm fine. That guy's got an issue, but not me. And we need to be careful with that. The danger of hypocrisy is a very real da danger. And we need to continue to examine our hearts. Jesus gives a very strong warning to the Pharisees in Matthew 23. We're going to go there for a minute. I'm not going to read all of these woes, but I've chosen some that um, I feel uh, you can feel the, the sting of, of the Lord's words. Now, as we're reading this, I want you to try not to think of anybody else. I want you to try to think of yourself. I want, to put your, I want you to put yourself on the chopping block and listen to these words as if Jesus was speaking to you. It's not, it's not comfortable because these aren't nice words that Jesus is going to say to them. But I want us to examine our hearts. Matthew 23, starting in verse 2, it says, The experts in the law and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Therefore, pay attention to what they tell you and do it, but don't do what they do. For they do not practice what they teach. They're hypocrites. They tie up heavy loads hard to carry, and they put them on men's shoulders. But they themselves 
are not willing even to lift a finger to move them. They do all their deeds to be seen by people, for they make their phylacteries wide and their tassels long. Phylacteries were a, a, they're these little boxes of scripture that they would tie to their head and tie on their arm. To us, it might be, we, you know, like we buy a really big Bible that everybody can see. <laughs> They love they loved the place of honor at banquets and the best seats in the synagogues. Verse 11, the greatest among you will be your servant, and whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Remember, the position that we are to seek after is humility. We are to be seeking to be the servant. It's not wrong to sit in places of honor, but there is a selfish desire to seek after those positions at the expense of others. Woe to you, verse 13, but woe to you experts in the law and you Pharisees, hypocrites. You keep locking people out of the kingdom of heaven, for you neither enter nor permit those trying to enter to go in. Woe to you experts in the law and you Pharisees, hypocrites. You cross land and sea to make one convert, and when you get one, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. Verse 23, woe to you, experts in the law and Pharisees, hypocrites. You give a tenth of mint, dill, and cumin, yet you neglect what is more important in the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Just giving 10% of our tithe as, as just a physical act God is asking for your whole heart. He's not just asking for outward giving. Jesus said, you should have done these things without neglecting the others. Verse 24, blind guides, you strain out a gnat, yet swallow a camel. Woe unto you, experts in the law, and, and you Pharisees, hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup so that the outside may become clean too. Have we, been, have we become guilty of outward appearances and what, uh, uh, making ourselves look a certain way around certain people, but we're not checking our heart? Verse 27, woe to you, experts in the law, and you Pharisees, hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs that look beautiful on the outside, but inside are full of dead men's bones. Woe to you, experts in the law, you Pharisees, hypocrites. You build tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, if we had lived in the days of our ancestors, we would not have participated with them in shedding the blood of the prophets by saying that you testify against yourself that you are descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Filling up then the measure, fill up then the measure of your ancestors, you snakes, you offspring of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? Not the typical Jesus message we may hear today, um, calling people snakes and vipers. I made a short list of some of the names that Jesus is calling the experts of the law. Hypocrites, offspring of vipers, hypocrites, snakes, hypocrites, whitewashed tombs, hypocrites, blind guides, hypocrites, children of hell, hypocrites, descendants of murderers. The reason I wanted to read this is that too often we can find ourselves in the place of the Pharisee. In, in Luke, you remember he stood and he prayed about himself and he said, God, thank you that I am not like those people. I'm not like them that do this, 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 and this. I do all these good things. Thank you, God. This, this was a wrong attitude. I've, I don't know how many times I've found myself praying something like that. Oh, thank God that's not me. Thank God I'm not like that guy. While we can be thankful that God has saved us from things, there is a selfish attitude that is not examining our heart and truly humbling ourselves before Christ. 
We want to be like the tax collector who beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me. God, thank you. He, he was still in a condition and a posture that recognized his condition, that without Christ, he was nothing. Without God, he was nothing but a sinner deserving of death. Remember, the law is not designed to heap burdens upon men's backs. But I feel like this is something that we can often do to one another. We put an ungodly standard on each other, and we heap a burden upon them to try to keep and uphold. And to, and to now we, we become that, that cup where we're cleaning the outside, but we're never confessing our sin. We're never actually dealing with some of the real issues that we need to deal with. It's easier to point our fingers out at somebody else and point out their problem than it is to actually inspect ourselves. But Jesus said that we need to first examine ourselves. Not that we, can, not that we can't ever approach our brother or sister and, and bring up an issue. But the, condi- the, the question is, have we first considered our own heart? Have we considered that maybe we might have a log in our own eye? Or two, or three? This leads us, I, I wanted to read a quote real quick from, from Calvin. I thought he summarized this um, verse um, in Timothy really well. He said that they pretended to have zeal for the law. They disregarded edification and attended only to frivolous disputes. It is an intolerable profanation of the law of God to draw out of it nothing that is profitable but merely to pick up materials for talking and to abuse the pretense of it for the purpose of burdening the church with contemptible trifles. He said it was like profanity of the law of God, like, like using the law of God as a swear word. That's what profanation of the law of God. We need to be careful how we speak to one another. We need to examine our hearts and be careful of self-righteous hypocrisy. So what is the right use of the law? Psalm 19.7 says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than the honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. So there is not a rejection of the law. It's a question of what use of the law. Going back to when in verse 8, we said, but we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully right? There is a proper use of the law. And he said, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless. The right use of the law for us as Christians is to reflect on it, to use it as a guide. The law of God is good if a man use it lawfully. It warns us, it directs us, it draws us, it teaches us, ultimately it saves us. John Calvin said it this way, the sum of the law is this, that we may worship God with true faith and a pure conscience and that we may love one another. Whosoever turns aside from this corrupts the law of God by twisting it to a different purpose. The law was given to us for this purpose, that it might instruct us in faith, which is the mother of a good conscience and of love. There is no true love where there is no fear of God. The right use of the law should lead us to a sincere faith. We should cry out like the psalmist, let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to unto, unto, unto God with psalms. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture. He said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. Christian, harden not your heart today. Examine your heart. Our posture should be one of worship to God. Heresies and doctrines of devils, they do creep up 
and they creep up in our heart, not just around us. And we need to be careful. Pride fills us full of self-righteousness and leads us to walking around as hypocrites, cursing one another and cutting one another down. Godly edifying in faith is the goal. Loving one another from a pure heart, getting rid of all our own selfish, spiteful garbage motivations and acting out of a good conscience from a faith rooted in, not in our righteousness, but in the righteousness of Christ. A true sign of maturity is to first consider ourselves. Like we were talking about earlier, we need to first take that log out of our eye so that we can help somebody else. But remember, we need to remember that there, it is two-parted. There, there is a still helping your brother if he has an issue. But there's a step that goes before it. It's to consider yourself, and then once you, you've examined your heart, you're right with God, then you can go help. It's important that both of those steps are important. Not just one, we don't just focus on ourselves and forget about our brother, and we don't just focus on our brother and forget about ourselves. Galatians says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. We're to bear one another's burdens. The glorious gospel. Practicing sound doctrine in the light of the glorious gospel is recognizing our need for the Savior. Have you been guilty of cleaning the outside of the cup and neglecting the weightier matters of the heart? Examine your heart. In 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verse 9, he said, Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and listen closely to this part. And if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of our blessed God, if there's any other thing that is in your heart that is contrary to sound doctrine, root it out. Examine your heart in light of the law. The law of our God is our guide for righteous living. It's our mirror to show us our need for Christ. Christian, look into the perfect law of liberty. Confess your sins to Christ and walk in the freedom of his glorious gospel. Paul, commanded by God to be an apostle, established that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the standard for teaching. It's the, the standard for sound teaching. So repent and believe the kingdom of, of heaven is at hand, for it is. Walk, Christian, in the glorious light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, who fulfilled the law for you, lived sinless for you, was mocked, scorned, and crucified for you. Jesus bled and suffered and died for you. He was dead in the grave for three days for you. He stayed not in the grave, but on the third day he rose for you. Walk, Christian, in that light, in the light of the Savior who loved you enough to die and resurrect for you. Resurrect, Jesus resurrected, he ascended to heaven, and said, all authority in heaven and earth had been given to me. Therefore, go. Repent and believe, Christian, and walk in the glorious light of the gospel of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, I pray that you would convict our hearts, Lord God, to examine our hearts. You know our sins. You know who we are. I pray that you would strip us of any self-righteous, foolish thinking, Lord God. Help us to examine ourselves in the light of your holy word. We thank you, Jesus, for your words. We thank you, King, that you have called us out of darkness and into light. We worship you. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen.